uh, this talk this talk's uh, supposed to be English. <laughs> so uh, I'll start in English, okay? Okay, today I'm gonna talk about the, some tips for calling developers. Uh, firstly, I wanna know <clears throat> how many of you have been already written, uh, writing Colin? Okay, uh, so this talk is for you, three of you. <laughs> uh, this, this will gonna be a, a little bit uh, advanced if you are not, if you haven't write, if you haven't written any Colin before, there'll be some kind of too advanced for you because Colin, uh, as previous talk, you already know that Kotlin has a lot of great features like no safety. Basically, it's just like Java. So it will take you about one one week to understand it. But after you uh, you you try you know it, know the uh, like smart casting, no safety, then you want to play more advanced skills, the topics about it. You can uh, hear out. There are many many um, articles out there, but uh, today I'll go some introduction. Okay. So firstly, it's about a uh, concern and cost, and some calling tips and next step, next step. Okay, concern. Um, firstly, about is the math account, right? Because we are living in the Android world. If you are under Android M, like 21, uh, you will have uh, the pain of uh, when you start the app, when you use the start the app, you will load multi the start the start performance will be very slow, right? So you, if you want to make it quicker after Android M, you can have installation time. Uh, they, they will do it for you, like our run time. But in Kotlin, uh, you will add method counts. If you add Kotlin, you will add method counts. The solution to it is use ProGuard. Uh, this is my experience when I, uh, when we uh, firstly add some with the Kotlin extension into our uh, project. <coughs> it's Firefox. Uh, it's focused. Fire, 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 Firefox focus. It only like. Uh, Less than 100 method counts, so actually it, it should be fine. So, and according to the official documents, the APK size before ProGuard will be around one megabyte and three or seven thousand methods. But after ProGuard, actually this is our result, right? It's it's like 300, around 400k k gigabytes and 50k for release. Uh, we have different uh, compile options for release and debug, but this, this this really depends on how many um, call, how many calling code in it, but I have, I have to say the impact is small, and the build time you I use Gradle Profiler I found that incremental build and instant run almost affect nothing. So I will say it doesn't it will it won't affect your build time, but if you're using like a full build you probably have some in, uh, like, like impact, but uh, the the user will get the release like five minutes later. <laughs> I think that should be fine, right? And the, stat the static analysis. Some people have a uh, problem about static analysis. I would say uh, we use some uh, like KT Lint. Uh, there's a typo here. And Android Lint in Android Studio 3.0, there's a lot of enhancement over there. The Android tools team, uh, the tech lead Tor Nobi gives a talk in calling uh, Conf this, uh, this November about Android Lint. <coughs> So I would say the tooling support is going to be better, better for Android developers. And the last thing is about the build options. Some developers in Pinterest, they say they have a problem with Perl build. Um, I don't have that uh, problem. I, I, I used Kotlin two years ago in my first production app, and I don't have any problem about working with CI. So I think it won't be a problem for now as well. OK, so some soft, uh, some soft concerns. About learning curve, there's a there's a question asked about the last sessions. It's less less than week. Uh, the best part is is the very confusing part because Kotlin is young, so you don't really know what's the best practice. So the, you are, you have one tools. One tool is the code, show Kotlin bytecode in your Android Studio or IntelliJ. Uh, it's very simple. You can from from the bytecode you will know what's best for you, right? And there's a convention document on the uh, official website. Oh, of course, you can search on the internet. There's a lot of best, home, best, practice, best practice about how to write calling code. And for some people say it will, it will hard for you if you want to do code review. I would say you need a leader. Your leader will, that willing to take the responsibility to fix things, to fix other people's crashes, to fix the like build crashes. So why not be a leader? Somebody has to you know, advance. You know, take the responsibility and take the risk, right? So you can be the leader. And the hiring process. Some people say it's very hard to find a calling de developer. I would say yes, but uh, according to Dan Lu, actually using 
calling is a kind of benefit. <laughs> uh, people love mini 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 uh mini SDK version above twenty one and calling developer uh, write code in Kotlin. So it's like a joy to developer. If you write this in your job description, I, I'm sure that some people that very talented will apply job for you, will apply for the job. So <laughs> I would say it's not it may not be a problem. Okay. So, so there are some user, users with big names like Basecamp, Pinterest, Uber, IntelliJ, uh, Cordart is another. Uh, they are using Kotlin in their production, in their product. So I would say it's very mature now. And there are some costs. Actually, there are two blog posts in, the, uh, in our web. It's very famous. They do the uh, Kotlin in idioms, uh, like profiling on art and on hotspot. So they got the same results, some idiom Calling idioms are better. Some calling idioms are not that good. Like higher order functions, lambda expressions, company object, they are awesome. Some some are even better than than Java. No safety range, and some are not that good. Like uh, variable arguments, and the delegations, properties, and some range operation. But uh, calling, like like I said before, calling is a very young language. So if you read the blog post like a couple of days ago, you'll find this. Improve generated by code performance. <laughs> so all the uh, <clears throat> I won't say uh, all, all the I won't say you don't have to profile. I would say profiling gives you a deeper understanding about language and how things works, not just looking at oh it's like black magic. It's like syntax sugar, uh, and you get a instead you get a, a better understanding a, a, about the language itself. Uh, actually, I would say don't avoid syntax sugar, because if you, if you don't really hate syntax sugar, then you should go to Write some assembly code, right? Actually, <laughs> every object-oriented language is like syntax sugar on C++ or C, right? So <laughs> we don't, please don't hate syntax sugar. And um, also, some people hate DSL. If you really hate DSL, then you don't write any Gradle. You please don't use Gradle, okay? <laughs> Gradle is like a DSL. So, okay, this is uh, <clears throat> about. Uh, after that, after this slide, it was all about code. So, yay. Idioms. Uh, first is how to read a uh, calling by code. It's very, si it's very simple. If you are using Mac, it's Command Shift A, and just type byte. And you will, uh, uh, first you have to be on the uh, calling uh, file, and then you will see by code. If you can read by code, I will really envy you because I I can't read <laughs> by code. But there's a button called decompile. You will make the calling code. To by calling bytecode and calling bytecode to Java, so you can know what's beyond the hook, right? So we're going to use this technology uh, uh, in the next slides. So firstly, is the property of fields. I think a lot of people have read documents. Maybe you have the same question about uh, like me. Uh, calling doesn't have fields. Calling always only have property. And my understanding is property is something with getter and setter. Fields don't have getter and setter, but what if you have a private property? Then you don't have getter and setter, so you have fields. So calling actually have fields, right? <laughs> so this really confused me. I, after some kind of research, I found the only thing that can can call to a field is that when you are uh, override, you're customizing your getter and setter of your property. If you access the property in the getter, the customize getter, you will get an infinite loop, right? Because your getter, 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 uh, getter code is, is calling, keep calling itself. So what you can fix it is to add the field uh, keywords. So you will, add, you will know that you're actually assessing, assessing the backing fields. So this is what I saw. Uh, maybe, the, maybe the answer, but I don't really don't know. Another thing is about object. Some people say that the static global variables are evil. <laughs> Sometimes you have to use it because we use a lot of like singleton patterns a, a lot. So in Kotlin solution is, is object. You can give the object a name. And when you want to access it, you can use, oh, sorry, I re reveal secret. When you want to <laughs> access it, you have to uh, access, reference it using the outer class and the object name. But when you're using companion object, you can just ignore the reference of the company, uh, company object name. Like the method is on the outer class itself. So it gives a kind of feeling like static. Actually, when you go to the compile uh, com decompile bytecode, You'll see uh, more details about it. We will go to go to that part later. So, when to you when to use companion? When not to use companion? Just use object. I will, I will have I will say uh, 
in my personal experience, if a companion object must to sit inside a class, so it ha must have a company. That's why it's called companion object. And companion object can skip its name when it's called. You see, you see, you've seen, see, seen the example. And each class ha can only have at most one companion object. So companion object is kind of a like very special object that tightly coupled to this class. Okay, now we're going to talk about static method. Uh, I read about documents that Colin has don't Colin, Colin doesn't have static methods, so I'm panic. I need static method. How do I do? Okay, so here's the example. Uh, there's a lot of code. Don't panic. First, you have a file. The file name is Colin component.kt. Okay, it has a package name com.example. It has a class named service. It has a first class citizen function. This is this function is not belongs to this class. It's a function, a top level function, just like a class. A class is a first, uh, first class citizen, citizen. What it do is to return a value. The value is a service instance. So in the calling code, a data package, you, you, um, you are, now you are in com, com, com down, that example, right? And you have this function. Then in another package, you are, if you are accessing these create methods, you have to add a package name in front of it. Okay, how about Java? If you're using Java and calling Colin and calling Colin's static methods, you found you need to specify something called component .k, component kt. What is this component kt come from? It's actually this file. So it gives each file a separated class under the hood. So this is why you have to uh, reference to the to to um, to the file name. You, you can, you, if you don't like this name, component KT, it feels very strange, you can use that annotation to make it as a, like a real Java, uh, like a real Java class. You can give it a, a name. Okay, another thing is about factory methods. Uh, when we are seeing is, about, is, is that the static method, we can use it, use the pack, uh, package level function as the static methods. What if I want to do something more than the, the just a static method? I want to I want to access the private member of that other class. Since it's the private member, you cannot access it from the other class. You, you cannot access it because it's a private, right? So you, what you can do is you write a company object, <clears throat> and in, in that company object, you can access the M, the, uh, the endpoint, the, the private member member, and also the private constructor. So this is this is how we. Uh, you write uh, static, uh, write static methods, factory methods in Colin. Uh, the apply here, you can skip it. I, I, I already spent a, a little bit about that. This very uh, interesting. So you can have the private member access. Okay, the last, uh, this is the last section about company object. So if we, now we're going to see some bytecode. This is a company object that is under my class and has a private field called tag. And I have a, I have a, um, it's compiled to a, a, fi fi a public static final class companion here. And you've, you know, you've noticed there's a getter here. So the getter really access my class .tag. You found because it's a companion object, the private member is attached to, the, to my class, to outer class. So you can see it's right here. It's in, it's in the my class. But if, if, if it's not a companion, that string tag will inside the companion. But this is not a point. A point here is the hello world, the method calls. If you want to print, print the tag, actually, under the hood, <laughs> it's a singleton, single instance companion uh, object with a getter to access this my class tag. <laughs> so you find it, the call loop is like a, it's like a snake, right? Uh, <clears throat> This is for a reason, but we are going to talk, we are not going to talk a reason about that. We are going to talk about how do we uh, fix this problem because we don't want the extra method called. However, how I can do, we can use this. We can use a const ver uh, a keyword. If I use count keyword, then the method call will be like a variable. It will be a constant. So <clears throat> this is how we use, uh, how, how do I get this code? I, I'm not very smart. I don't. I cannot do the human compiler myself. I just go to show calling by code. So this is how we do it. So if you have a problem, you can always provide it later. Okay, about Lambda. I have struggled with Lambda when I first uh, played with Colin because it's really out of out of my mind. I, I've never used Lambda before. 
But after some digging, I found, okay, let's, do, let's, let's look from the client side. Everything starts from the client side, okay? We have a method called hire, and the hire function calls a, a pass in a lambda. Let's see the declaration of the parameter here. The parameter says this hire function, hire methods accept the parameter. The parameter name is up. Okay, the up is a function. The function takes no parameter and returns unit. So that's all. So when, actually how, how do we use this parameter? We pass in the print line, uh, the big, uh, in the brackets, a curly brace, and we just invoke it. We run it, run the method. Run the method just like, it's a method, yeah, right. OP and with a parenthesis. So it, when it decompile, or we show calling by code, do some decompilation, we found actually the passing lambda is anonymous class. <clears throat> and we call the default uh, method called invoke. So what we can do here is, uh, what, what we found that we are doing, we are creating anonymous class and we are having an extra object and have an extra method called. So this is the <clears throat> cost of lambda. If you use Rich Lambda, if you use uh, Java Lambda, it's all the same. You have the um, extra object and methods. If you want to know the cost about it, you can Google Jake Walton Lambda cost on um, Google search. Then you'll find there's a comparison about how to, if you use Java Lambda, if you use Ritual Field Lambda, uh, Ritual Lambda Lambda, or use Kotlin Lambda. And <laughs> there's a, like how many methods counts you got. Oh, there's, this is this the comparison that, about that. But what we're, we're talking here is, if you use lambda, you have extra object, it's anonymous class, and uh, extra method called. What we can do is use inline keywords. <clears throat> if we use inline keywords, the magic will happen. In the code side, the code will change. Uh, the method suddenly becomes like a template. You'll see the start and end call is just like this one, start and end. And op.invoke is actually the function that you pass in. You say hi. So if you use inline, you will copy paste your code into the into your color size. So you find that you don't have the extra object and you don't have the extra method called. So you will have even less. That's, that's why sometimes you write calling lambda, you'll make your app performance better than Java lambda. So we re reveal the secret. So you'll copy paste your code inside. So another good thing about inline keyword is reinfine generics. Oh, this is very cool. When, I, when you use inline keywords, you can use reinfine this keyword in your generics. Normally, you cannot do this because uh, the T uh, type parameter T here is going to be inference during runtime. So in compile time, the, the, the compiler doesn't know the type. You cannot do this. But if you, since you already mark it as inline, the compiler is very smart. It knows this code, this this type will be copy paste into the color side. So it's actually T is actually a string. <clears throat> so you will see the decompiled Java code. Uh, you will find the calling code, you will find this calling instance of string. So this is happening at compile time. So suddenly you, ha you can have compile time gener uh, generics, like reinfine generics. Uh, I think it's a very cool. If you are a SDK developer, you'll love this. But if you are not a SDK developer, mm, I think you, sh you should be fine. Returns. I have a very difficult time dealing with Lambda returns. Like this function here seems to be very simple. It's a range one to 10, and each one, one to 10 for each, I'll print one, two, three, four, print it. It means the passing uh, parameter. And if it is dividable by five, then I'll return. So um, some of you want to answer this question, what's gonna print? I have a, a little souvenir for him is, uh, I'm from Mozilla, right? Uh, this is a Mozilla notebook. <laughs> Although this talk is not, not about Mozilla. Some people want to try it. What's the result of this function? Anybody want to try it? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, I'll try myself. <laughs> so first is one, two, three, four, five. So it should be one, two, three, four, and with five, it should return. How? Then uh, that's a problem. 
where does this return goes? Actually, this return will go to the function. So you will just print one, two, three, four, five. Five will be called because it's before the, the, the if statement. The end will not be called because it returns the function. It returns to the function. So what can I can do? Well, if I want to really want to print this line, I can use return and let a, a label to it. At my return at my label. So it will return to the for each here. So it will keep the for each will continue going. So it will be one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, nine, ten, and end. Another thing I don't want to use it. I can use just add for each. It will give me the same result. This is the local return. So you can return locally. Another thing, another solution is use the anonymous, anonymous class. Anonymous class, you can also return here and return to anonymous, anonymous class. And you will keep on the for each. So you will still bring 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 9, 9, 10, and end. Tail recursion. I didn't use the, this, this at all. I, don't, I didn't use this at all, but I think it's very super cool. Normally, when you do a factorial, uh, you do this, right? Uh, if it's one zero, you return one. If it's uh, else, you return number, and you do the recursive call. And if you write the recursive call like this, your last recursive call, the last return statement, is the same as your function itself. It, you can add it as a tail recursion. And what it gives you is a very cool stuff called, uh, normally it's like this, right? But in, it, it makes the recursive call to a uh, for loop to a loop, and it keeps changing the value of the parameter. What's the difference of these two calls? You can avoid stack overflow. Uh, stack call, um, stack overflow. You can be more if, um, resource efficient, right? So this, I found this is a fundamentals. It is a very cool trick if you are writing functional program or you, you are writing yourself some kind of architecture. It will avoid a lot of stuff. Um, we just stop from here because I, I didn't use it by myself, but it's just something we can, don't be afraid of it. It's actually, it's very cool. It's not that hard. And this is some uh, like range versus until you can find, until you uh, had an extra object called in range. So you can do the uh, uh, checking by yourself. Delegation, okay. Um, we have a lazy delegation. This one means we only uh, reference lazy parameter when it's actually being rest access. So firstly, we call create, and from the client side call, we create, uh, we uh, initialize the property, lazy property class, and then we access the, really access the property dot lazy, really access the property. And we found that it print out, oh sorry, it print out calculate the value, this is this line, and then print out first SS42, for first SS42. And I call it second time, it will call, it will still, it will only print out second SS42. Why? Because it will catch the value. So uh, next time, it will di return directly. This is called lazy. This is sometimes useful when you are using, like, um, if you look at code of, of quarter knife, it's actually doing that. So you can, you can make your, uh, Delegation more fast. You can you can do the cache, uh, lay, do the delegation lately, like lazily, and um, next time when you access it, you will be much faster. And our servables, our servable delegation. This is another thing. This I think is very cool. Let's start from the uh, client side call. Uh, we have a main function. You you create the person object and give it a name and his age and her age and uh, salary. And now you want to do the that plus plus, after one year, his her age gets older and um, salary increase. So what's what's under hood? What what will happen? So we have the class name person, and here's a and she has a property called age and property called salary. When we access the property, we'll call this delegate observer, and this observer will do something like um, when this when these properties get called, it will print. The property name and all value and new value. So every time I say H plus <clears throat> plus, I okay, I'll, I get this line. H is uh, from twenty five to twenty six, and I get I say salary uh, plus equal a hundred, and I got this one. So why is this useful? Imagine that you are you are mutating the state uh, of your Android app. So you have a state, 
uh, uh, U.S. state. You have <coughs> you have a state property called U.S. state. There's a there's a uh, observable delegation, and firstly, give you an initialized value. It's signing prompt like you're, if you're uh, logged into something, and then while the values change, some people just update the states like U.S. state equals U.I. state assigned to the new states, and the delegation uh, the observer will change according to the new state, and uh, and this curly braces is the uh, UI change. So your code gets cleaner. And this is something we always want for like Redux people, they have map state to props. But Android, we <coughs> modify each state directly, we modify each views directly. Uh, we don't get this. But with our level, we can do that. Standard library is something uh, people don't look at it very often. Let's take a look at the let. Let, let's assume we have a list, uh, his, his, uh, his value is a list, and with string type, it's knowable, and we give it an initialized value. L what let is, what let, let us do is, if this quotation mark, if let is, if this list is null, we don't do above, uh, we don't do below code, uh, below code. So this, this block of code is actually no pointer free. The entire block is code, you don't have to, uh, you can limit the usage only here. <clears throat> and if it's not null, if it's not null, you can use it eat to access the list. And you can do it by like this, it at A, B, C, and remove A, and remove the, uh, the second element, which is index one. So that will be uh, the second, so that will be C. And print it, so the, the, it's, it's, it's B here. If you want to do crazy, you, you can do something like this. If it that size is equal to zero, you return end, else it turn true. Wow, you, you cannot do this normally in, in, in normal Android code, right? But you can do it here. Why? Because <coughs> here you're gonna get true. Let's take a look at uh, this standard library uh, function. It's the extension function. It's a function with receiver, uh, sorry. It's an extension, sorry, it's not receiver. It's an extension function that uh, extend t, type t, and what it do, it, asset, it accept a parameter called block. The block is a function. The function takes t as a parameter and return r. And the r, the value of r, uh, the type of r is defined by block, by the block you pass in. So if you, if this block pass, um, uh, returns a, a string, and the result will be string. If this block returned true, and the result will be Boolean. So how can you do it? Because um, actually everything is is uh, in everything is under any is special type, so you can do this kind of stuff. Another standard library is called apply. So apply is a little bit like uh, like let. But in let in apply, you can use you, you don't have to use it. You can you, you can just call add like you're add, actually operate on the list. So add add a add b add b add c remove a remove the second index and print it out. And then you got the return value is result. The result is actually a list. So what can you do this kind of stuff? It's, it's actually it's, it's, I think it's kind of like builders, right? Is actually type is array list, a knowable array list of string, and the size is one. How can you do it? Because it's an inline function, and this, this function is the uh, lambda with receiver. It has it's an extension function that extend uh, any uh, extend type t, and it takes a parameter, a, fun, a block function. It it is an extension function and return unit. So after this run, of, this block of code is run, it will return this. So it will return the type that you just call. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, you return type here. So in this, ki in this kind of, using this kind of standard library, just like Legos, you can build a lot of stuff on top of it and build a lot of things like chaining. So you don't have, you don't need the Ice Java to do the chaining. You can do, you can just use standard library. And there are only less than 10 standard library in Colin code. So it's, you cannot imagine how small it is, but it's very powerful. Another thing is repeat. 
like repeat this lambda three times. Every time you got the pass in it, so you print one, two, three. So uh, if you want to look at the uh, implementation, it's repeat and it takes the int. There's time another a function. A function is access int and return a unit. It's void, and you do you just do it uh, like how many times? So there are a lot of other. Um, there are a lot of standard library, not a lot of. Some standard library run with, take if, also take unless. If you go to, if you really want to dig into the standard libraries and you have played with it a little bit, then you can know, you can be a better Kotlin developer actually <laughs> because you're not just using the basic no safety, you're not using the smart cast, you're using some more um, things you can build your own stuff. Design patterns, I think Kotlin has respect the design patterns, so that just say singleton, Delegation, you can have your own delegate. Your de the delegation will override get value and set value. So every time this property is get value or set value is called, it's actually calling this class, delegation class, get setter and getter and setter. So it will, uh, w it will perform the getter and setter uh, on your behalf. So this is delegation, this is a customized delegation. And builder, uh, you can have like kind of stuff like ty type safe builders. Actually, if you want to implement type state builder, you have to understand a lambda with receivers uh, and uh, invoke invoke on object itself. And sometimes you need to understand uh, infix uh, in the pre last presentation. So, like this block of code after it's run, you actually print the XML. But this 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 uh, HTML is going to be type safe, so it will check in the compile time for you. This is another f uh, way to drive factory methods. Okay, uh, we're going faster. Some tips, beware of autoboxing. If it's a newable class, uh, beware you don't use more newable class everywhere. Because if it's newable in com when you compile to uh, bytecode, it will actually be an object. Uh, if you use the non-nual, like free here, it will just like pr Java primitive. So it's, it, it will save a lot of memories. So if you're doing undraw, please don't use non-nual, okay? Undraw is keep, it will keep running, right? And for Java library developers, you are writing Java libraries, make your same type uh, parameter in the last element so it can be uh, changed to, you can, the, the, the curly brace can move out. And like this, this argument about when to use stream, where to use for loop. So here's, a, I, I, I heard it's very useful. If it's IO bound, use stream. If CPU bound, use for loop. Because stream will always create extra objects. If it's, it's already CPU bound, and you use stream, you, you, you can imagine you'll create a lot of object, right? <clears throat> this is KT Lint. KT Lint is a static analysis tool. It give you like static code analysis. It's very simple. I copied this kind of this block of code from a colleague of mine. He wrote a blog post. He just wrote gradle.kt Lint, and you will check this out for you. Okay, if you are if you are uh, uh, SDK developer, this this one you definitely need to look at it. It's a deprecated, it's deprecated annotation. Like so, for instance, we have a function called invoke. This invoke function actually is calling old. If we want to old this, we, we want to mo uh, make this old function deprecate. We have to explicitly not just strike through it. We need to give it a this w reason why it's deprecated, and we have extra. We can add extra replace with. This is uh, replaced with give you, you can uh, let, let the user knows what to replace. So you have, if you hit command and enter, it will replace the code for you. And this deprecation level, if it's warning, user will see something like this. You will still compile, compile. but if it's an error, the user won't compile. And ha the user have to, your client need to uh, change, uh, to, to, to upgrade to your new SDK. Another thing is called hidden. Uh, this is why you why you need this, this hidden because this method may be still be, be used by other uh, library. You want to keep the binary compatibility. So what's next? Code routines. Normally we don't write callbacks. Firstly, we write callback the nsync task like this, and then we have ask promise future. We can write something like this, like a stream, like flow. Very nice. Subscribe. But you still have to remember and do the error, error handling very correctly. Coroutine uh, uh, is not a new invented idea. It's very old, actually. 
um, you can Google coroutine canoe Donna canoes, and you <laughs> you got a lot of result. And in Java coroutine, it's an experiment uh, library that um, it's a Kotlin library, so it's that for, it's only for Kotlin, and it will do something like a single weight, so you can have a single weight in your Java code and your in your Kotlin code. So if it's, we have two met functions, one is one cost one second, two, the other cost two seconds. If I do them asynchronously, uh, and this will, when, when the compiler sees this, it will wait for the first one to complete, and this will wait for the second one to complete, and print out the result. And then this measure time millisecond is not coroutine, it, it's just a wrapper that gives you the time to return the start time and end time and do it at minus. So you can know how many times this, uh, this block of code used. So this will actually use two seconds because these two, these two calls are start and synchronously. So we start at the same time. If you remove the sync, call, uh, a sync here, it will be one second and two seconds, it will be three. Another, thing, another good example is uh, how co why calling is, uh, calling is coroutine is an uh, uh, alternative of threads because if you run like 100k threads, you will definitely get an out of memory exceptions because you don't have that much memory. Uh, each, each thread will alloc allocate a lot of memories, but call, every call routine is actually a state machine. So you just you have some states that keep uh, for each call routines, and it will print there. It will print very easily. So definitely take a look at call routines. I'm still learning, but uh, there's not there. I have to say there's no example, and there's even I can say there's almost no example <laughs> currently. But uh, we can keep an eye on it. Okay. So some fun projects. Okay. Uh, Firefox Focus. It's a privacy browser, and it's calling ready. It's already on master branch yesterday. <laughs> so you want to contribute it? It's on GitHub. It has one million download. You want to put something in your resume? It is a very good starting point. It's GitHub. It uses WebView, so it's very friendly. So uh, welcome. <laughs> This is my colleague's project, and Firefox Data. You can you can read. It's a Java library that give you um, give your uh, if you have a Firefox account, you can get your history, bookmark, and password. And this call is also calling ready. You have some calling test in it, and I just add a pull request about first calling um, sample, but uh, you it's, but it's also calling ready, so you can contribute on GitHub. Another thing is Firefox for Android. This is the app I'm working on. Uh, we have like 17 million downloads, something. Uh, this is for security. And we're going to have Colin in the near future, I hope. <laughs> and uh, you, we use Mercurial, but you, there's a method you can use Git to contribute to it as well. It's a Gecko base, so the render engine is Gecko, it's not WebView. And we deeply care about each people's uh, security, so Everybody's bookmark and reader histories, we, we cannot access it. Even if it's on our server, it's encrypted. Only the client side can encrypt can, can decrypt that information. So we cannot do uh, big data on your bookmark and, hi and histories. Uh, that's how strict it is to do anything in uh, Mozilla because everything needs a privacy review, security review, <laughs> a lot of reviews. So you can make sure your data is safe with us. Okay, so. Uh, these are another thing we are hiring. We are uh, looking for Android developers as well as front end developers. So, welcome. Nobody's taking screenshot. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope I can get some good people with me. Okay. And there are some news and resources about coding conventions, calling conf. Uh, if you're around San Francisco around uh, November. And there are two calling books. And the official document is awesome. If you are learning something in Kotlin, definitely go to the official document because it has very details, it, almost everything you need, uh, unless you want Android samples. <laughs> and there's a podcast, uh, it's, calling, it's talking Kotlin. Uh, the host is not an Android developer, but he interviewed a lot of Android developers. And some Kotlin native news. You can write Kotlin in, uh, that will compile to JavaScript and compile to iOS. So have fun. Thanks.